Okay, ladies, so I am going to read to you the Prioresses section of the Canterbury Tales. I want you to follow along. I'm just using my cursor. I'm going to start here at the very top and flip right down to the bottom and move the screen as I go. So follow and I'll discuss. There was also a nun, a prioress, her way of smiling, very simple and coy. Her greatest oath was only by St. Louis, and she was known as Madame Eglantine. And well, she sang a service with a fine, intoning through her nose, as was most seemly. She spoke daintily in French, extremely. After the school of Stratford at Bow, French in the Paris style she did not know. At meat, her manners were well taught withal. No morsel from her lips did she let fall, nor dipped her fingers in the sauce too deep, but she could carry a morsel up and keep the smallest drop from falling on her breast. For courtliness, she had a special zest, and she would wipe her upper lip so clean that not a trace of grease was to be seen. Upon the cup when she had drunk, to eat she reached a hand sedately for the meat. She certainly was very entertaining, pleasant and friendly in her ways, and straining to counterfeit a courtly kind of grace, a stately bearing fit to her place, and to seem dignified in all her dealings, as for her sympathies and tender feelings, she was so charitably solicitous. She used to weep if she saw but a mouse caught in a trap. If it were dead or bleeding, and she had little dogs she would be feeding, with roasted flesh or milk or fine white bread, and bitterly she wept if one were dead. Or someone took a stick and made it smart. She was all sentiment and tender heart. Her veil was gathered in a seeming way. Her nose was elegant, her eyes glass gray, uh, let's see, I'm going to move over here. Her mouth was a very small, but, but soft and red. Her forehead certainly was fair of spread. Almost a span across the brows, I own. She was indeed by no means undergrown. Her cloak, I noticed, had a graceful charm. She wore a coral trinket on her arm. A set of beads, the gaudies tricked in green, whence hung a golden brooch of brightest sheen on which there first was graven a crowned A, and lower a more Vincent Omnia. Another nun and chaplain were at her cell, was riding with her and three priests as well. Okay, so I'm going to flip back to the first screen here. And if you notice, I have all of my annotations here just for you to see. So what I've been doing is, is making a note of what number pilgrim we are on and making it kind of stand out so I can see. I also did these in different colors as you'll see as we go along. So this is our first religious pilgrim that we're going to get to meet and along the way Chaucer uh, encounters many different kinds of religious and makes many statements on the religious as he goes. Some good, some bad. All right so look at my highlights as we go and I'll talk about my annotations. So the prioress being our first religious, she's very simple and coy, a nice smile. She's called a nun or a prioress. And then when we head down here, she has an actual name. Her name is Madame Eglantine, which is interesting because you'll notice that she's not called sister something, right? She has what sounds like a very fancy, very formal name. Um, she also has a little kind of saying right here by St. Loy. It's a little the phrase she's known for or uses. As we go further, it says here she sang at service intoning through her nose. So she has this nasally sort of singing voice, but she's very free and happy to sing through service. Then we move into the speaking French. She spoke daintily in French, which she learned at school. So it implies that she did not learn it from being in Paris or France. She learned it from school in school books. Um, the next part we talk about her manners. This is kind of I bracket it into multiple lines here and we have manners that were well taught. No morsel from her lips did she let fall and she didn't dip her fingers in the sauce too deep. So she's very, imagine her like a lady at tea. 
It almost, if, if I didn't tell you she was religious, you might not even be able to guess it um, because of the way she's acting. She's acting like a, a courtly lady, okay? Neat manners, neat eating, formal, courtliness, proper, upper class, not messy. All of those words could describe her. Nothing falls onto her breast. She wipes her face with her, you know, the little edge of her napkin on the edges of her lips. And she stays very, very clean. Down here, line 140, we're talking about her being entertaining. She's probably excellent at communication, conversation. Um, although she's kind of faking it, it says here, to counterfeit a courtly kind of grace. So is she faking or is she forcing this courtly grace? Again, keeping in mind, she's trying to act like a lady when she's a nun. Not that a nun can't act like a lady, but it's a whole different situation. All right, let's keep going here. Talking about her feelings, her sympathies and her feelings. She has um, empathy. Um, she has empathy. Okay, so we were talking about her feelings. Um, she has empathy. So if you notice here, she cries over a dead mouse caught in a trap. She also, a little further down, um, weeps if somebody takes a stick and hits her dog. Um, we'll notice here, they call her tender heart. We notice here that she feeds her dogs very well. Roasted flesh, milk, fine white bread, which is odd because nuns take this vow of poverty where they should not be able to treat their animals so well with such good food. Um, you know, back in those days, animals kind of lived on the street pretty much. It wasn't like, I mean, you had pets, but you didn't treat our pets like we do now, like our people. Uh, a few other things here, again, with the tender heart, and then we go into some physical features. A veil in a, all very in its place. Her nose is elegant. Her eyes are glass gray. I'm going to pop onto the other screen here, um, right back here again her forehead. It says she has a very wide forehead. She has her veil up like, like the nuns from the old days where you couldn't see their hair. She would have her fair spread forehead spanning, uh, accentuate it because she has no bangs and no hair showing. It says she's not undergrown, which kind of, you know, it, it implies she's a very good looking, sturdy woman, um, maybe a little plump. Um, she's wearing a nice coat. But another odd thing is she has a lot of jewelry. Right? She has a coral trinket on her arm, a set of beads, gaudies, which they call like um, green, long green, large green beads, maybe prayer beads, but still jewelry-ish looking. And then she has this brooch, a golden brooch of brightest sheen, graven with a crowned A. So she has this beautiful gold pin. And look at the sentiment on the pin. Amor Vincent Amier. It means... Um, Love conquers all, which is another strange thing for a nun to have. Does it mean God's love conquers all? It could, but could it also mean like the love of humans, like man and a woman love conquers all, which would be an odd thing for a nun to be wearing. Lastly, if you notice here in purple, it is highlighted who she is traveling with. She has a, a companion who is a nun, uh, a chaplain, and three priests. So she is not traveling alone, but there is no information on her companions. It's really mostly about her. Okay, so go back over this information and please make sure you have citations, annotations, and completely understand uh, direct and indirect characterization.